Okay, welcome inside the Sportsnet Ice Surfing Studios, one of the many studios that Elliot Friedman and I use for the 31 Thoughts podcast. Yeah. And we reserve this one when we have special guests, namely someone who is, make sure I get the business card right here, uh, working for the NHL, doing social impact, growth, and legislative affairs. Uh, you know, may, you may know him better as the uh, former NHL defenseman with Calgary, Pittsburgh, Boston, and the Edmonton Oilers. Please welcome Andrew Ferentz to the Thirty One Thoughts podcast. It's fantastic to be here, and, and there's I'm surrounded by Bruins memorabilia, which yeah, is like which that? is fantastic. Thanks. Made you feel comfortable. Uh, memories of 2011. We're going to get to a lot of those Boston Bruins oh, stories. I assure you. <laughs> um, but I got the business card right. Social impact, growth, and legislative affairs. Yeah, and my kids look at me with like complete confusion when I okay. say that. <laughs> I only what have my that? I only have my BA. So explain what that means. Uh, well, I mean, so it's a new department uh, that the commissioner put together with uh, my boss Kim Davis, who came in in January. I came in in March, um, and it it really does cover everything that's said there. Uh, uh, we do everything from Hockey Fights Cancer to our diver- diversity and inclusion, Hockey is for Everyone programs, uh, all the way to government work in Ottawa and D.C. Um, a lot of the stuff that I do is built on infrastructure, uh, infrastructure support for places that you know our game is played. And not just like pro arenas, but community rinks and uh, uh, all the way down to street hockey. So Now, first of all, my favorite game I've ever covered of yours was the glove malfunction. <laughs> Yes. Okay, so Hang let's on, use let, the ironic quotation marks around malfunction. <laughs> first of all, so let's set the scene. You guys are down two nothing in that series, first round against Montreal. Uh, yeah, and that was that was one of the best first round series I ever covered. Nathan Horton scoring an overtime in Game Seven to win it, and uh, you score a, a did you score a huge goal. Was that a big goal in Montreal? Yeah, it was a big and goal you, in Montreal, and you gave the finger to the crowd. Yes. And then at the end of the game, first of all, I couldn't believe you came out to talk to the media. <laughs> like I was in the room. I was astonished when they told me that you were going to talk. And uh, then so you said. So um, it looks awful. I admit it. I completely apologize to, uh, to how it looks. But uh, I can assure you guys, you guys have covered me long enough to know that that's not part of part of my repertoire. I was putting my fist in the air. So I'm sorry. It looks it does look awful. I just saw it. Your glove malfunction, and yep. I, wa- I tweeted it out, and I walked to the bar, and Glenn Healy looked at me and goes, how could you tweet that? You know that is total BS. How could you even tweet that? I said, Glenn, I got to report what he says. Oh, and Glenn hated me, too, because uh, we, had, we, had we were button heads at the PA. Yes. Uh, so I remember his commentary after I did it. I watched I watched the game, and he was just roasting me on there too. I'm yes, like, he was. play it slower, Glenn. Thanks a lot, man. <laughs> uh, so it was obviously contentious. Uh, Bruins, Montreal. I could probably fill an hour of stories of that rivalry of the things that my wife witnessed in the stands, and you know. You know, the Montreal semi trucks parking outside of our hotel, honking horns, and people throwing stuff at us and rocking our bus, and you know the the stuff they'd yell at Char on the walk towards the game is like absurd, right? So I mean, it builds up, builds up. But oh, kinda, we're going to ask you about all this. After, it's but tell this story. insane. Uh, so obviously emotions are running high. Earlier in that shift, I got hit by somebody, maybe Placanic in my own end, um, and you know all the fans are ah, banging on the glass and you know yelling at me and stuff like that and. Uh, and, and so I went down the ice and just got a lucky kind of bounce and, you know, put one, put one up on price and it was just primal emotion. <laughs> and just, uh, you know, one of those things, man, I, I don't know. I, I, there's no, there's no good excuse, but, um, I, I, I looking back, I think it's hilarious. Like, oh, yeah, hundred uh, percent. Uh, but, uh, who came up with the glove malfunction idea? So, <laughs> so I probably shouldn't incriminate anybody, but I got called back into the into the back room where the coaches and everybody, you know, management and stuff uh, is, and and they 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 just kind of played the video for me and looked at me and said like, w- "What are you doing?" Because <laughs> nobody on the bench knew I did it, right? Because like we we're just playing the game, and so they're not watching TV, like they're they're just playing the game, and so they're like, "Well, like you're gonna have to say something," and and. Uh, I, or I think it was that year, earlier that year, um, who was it on the Islanders? Somebody got suspended for a hand gesture, I think, towards oh, Avery. Oh, James Yeah, yeah, Avery. yeah. Yes. That's right. So yes. I think he got susp- – did he get suspended, I think? Uh, he, was it I, two? I, I think he – uh, we'll one or, we'll one or two. Anyways, look it up I mean, yeah. you're in playoffs and you're against the, 
like you do anything you can to not get in trouble. So I, I, I like true story. Those were brand new gloves that game. <laughs> they were legitimately brand new gloves. And I said, well, new gloves are stiff. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> <laughs> just so happens the one digit. Uh, didn't uh, move. So it was a terrible excuse. And it, and it is actually like, honestly, looking back, it's quite embarrassing. I should have just owned it and, and whatnot, but I was honestly scared to get suspended. And so I just, lied you know quite frankly and and it's stupid looking back on it but you know in the heat of moment you do a lot of stupid things to win and uh uh so now my daughter you know gets instagrammed you know like all the time all her buddies at school all play hockey so every time it's on like funny hockey clips or whatever instagram (laughs) account like best selly ever you know (laughs) she gets like all these messages from her buddies and she's like oh thanks dad (laughs) but even better part of that story is we go back to boston and uh, I lived right in the North End, so, you know, the Italian neighborhood. And uh, I go to my, my condo, and on the buzzer board, you know, where you buzz in to get yeah. into the building, all these envelopes are taped to the, my buzzer board, and they're full of money. And so the people in the neighborhood... Pay the fine? Pay the, pay fun. the fine. <laughs> and so oh, there's messages like, that was the best game ever. <laughs> go Bruins. <laughs> you know, <laughs> all these things, you know, all these great messages from, from my neighbors and from the people in the neighborhood. Uh, so I, I might have came out on top. I don't know, but yeah, it was all right. So what did they say to Chara? Uh, oh well, I I can't I can't say it on here. It's it was in English and it was horrible. But I you, I know you can't you can't censor. How did he react to it? Well, he's fine. He's I mean, like, he's heard it all going back when he came over and veins, played Prince yeah. George. So, but I mean, you walk down the street and there would be like some little Montreal guy poke his head out of a store and you know call him you know a pretty derogatory thing and then just like run around the corner right like it was like <laughs> poke poke the bear and run kind of thing mm-hmm. and he would just you know ice in his veins but you know i mean he he gets you know he can't blend in he, he's got it rough you know everywhere he goes one of the more interesting stories that was such a fascinating team and a fascinating time uh in nhl history with that boston bruins squad and one of the more interesting ones to me andrew was a game against dallas and danny paillet catches ray swata and it's a hit to the head and normally in a situation like that, it's, you know, protect the hive and all the players jump to the player's defense. And, oh, I know Danny and he wouldn't do that. And Pae not that kind of player. And, and right away you said, hold on a second. And I'm paraphrasing you here. We said, we can't be hypocritical. We didn't like the Savard hit. We didn't like the Bergeron hit. So we can't like that hit. That's almost unprecedented. And I remember on hockey night, you know, Don Cherry had a go at it. Mike Milbury had a go at it as well. Can you take us back? To that a the, the, that game against Dallas and the the subs because there was a whole but don't forget there was a big talk at that time that what Andrew Ferrand said is going to divide the dressing room and this team will never win again and take us back well like compared to flipping off and lying about it <laughs> you know <laughs> you know there's times when you actually do do the right thing and and you know it, it's uh, uh, I was with Kobe Bryant like about a I don't know a month ago month and a half ago at a conference and. You know, I have a respect for him and, you know, p- you know, people have different opinions about him, but he has a great thing on leadership. And, he, you know, he says that leadership can actually be pretty lonely because it means sometimes, you know, saying the tough things and yeah. saying things that everybody doesn't necessarily want to hear, but it's the right thing to say, you know. And so I, 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 I probably butchered his quote, but whatever. Um, we had a room in Boston that was full of leaders and full of um, – it was the best workplace environment I've ever been in. You know, people could be themselves. They could be honest. Um, you know, not too far from, you know, some of the conversations we had with like Jerome and myself, like those kind of open conversations. Yeah. Um, and so I was confident, you know, I, I had no problem with my room and my coaches and, and the guys in there. Um, quite frankly, I could, in my whole career, I, I couldn't really care less if Don Cherry didn't like what I said or Mike Milbury. It was, that's not a concern to me. The only concern was that you have the respect and the trust of the people within that room. Uh, so I talked to Danny Pye, you know, I talked to Danny about that. And, and, uh, I think even before I, you know, said anything to the media and, um, the Savard thing was, was horrible for our room. Right. I mean, just everything from, we didn't really feel like we got proper revenge you know however barbaric that sounds Mm -hmm. um you know we lost a best player we saw a guy you know whose life was turned upside down from a bad hit 
so on and so forth. And, and I remember at that time being so pissed off, you know, not only at, you know, the Penguins, but every team that, you know, rushed to defend a guy on a really bad hit. And I get it. Like I've been suspended and I, you know, argue for myself about how the hit's not as bad as it looks and this and that. I, so I get it. I get how it works, but I don't know. It was just kind of a turning point where, um, I wanted so badly for, um, you know, for teams to, to quit being so hypocritical and at least, you know, nudge towards, toward the middle of saying like, you know what, that, that wasn't such a great hit. You know, we got to get rid of that in our game. Um, and not crucify your own player, but still just have a ounce of credibility, you know, in talking about a really tough issue. What was it like in the room after that? I think that was Super Bowl weekend too. I can't remember who Honestly, had Honestly, I think it was no big someone. deal really. I mean, that, that, that was the, the note that I got too. It was like, you know, Merrick, it's not that, it's not really that big a thing here in our room. Well, and we had the type of room where everybody in that room knew you had each other's back. Something happened on the ice. Like we probably had more quasi line brawls and, you know, redemption. That, you know, like, that same team. I mean, yeah. That kind of turned that year around. You know, like everybody trusted each other. Everybody knew that we were there for each other. And, and I think that, you know, if you're in that situation, like I said, I've been in that situation where you deliver a bad hit and you feel horrible. Like it's a terrible feeling if you hurt somebody or you do something and you get it like when you're on your suspension call you're gonna you know try to get it as few games as possible so you're kind of gonna say whatever you can to get as few games as possible but at the same time like you know if it's bad or good and and you know that you're you know that your teammates you know it's hard to stand there in front of the media and just lie through your teeth and say oh it wasn't a bad hit you know like that sucks too so i don't know it's a tough it's a tough thing, you know. It's I'm not trying to say it's easier that everybody should just be honest about it because, I don't know, it doesn't necessarily work. But, f- you know, for the better of the game, like you need a dose of honesty when when bad stuff happens, and not just, you know, pure partisanship. You know that that was quite a team. Like that was a great team to cover. That Bruins team. There were a lot of you always knew if you had to pick someone to talk to in an intermission or after a game. There was always someone to talk to you, a lot of different personalities, and it was it was a really good group. I remember being on the bench for my pregame hit, game three of that Stanley Cup final. So you lose the first two games in Vancouver, and game three, Vancouver goes out for the warm-up, and then you guys come out. And Sean Thornton, I'm watching this from the bench, and I'm like, what? What? Sean Thornton skates over the red line into the Vancouver end of the ice, twice and play the puck and Roberto Luongo is looking at him like what the hell is going on here and I've always been told that between game two and game three of that series you guys had a pretty honest conversation where you said if we're not what the Bruins are supposed to be we are never going to win this series is that true yeah we had lots of honest conversations um that was it was a really special group and not just that year that we won um you know you go back the year before when we lost you know we lost uh, after being up 3-0 to to Philly and um some of the different playoff series that we lost together as a team with that core group of guys and so we'd been through a bit together and um obviously it all worked out in 2011 but we're at a point like I said not too different from you know what we just talked about with Pi A but you know we're um able to have really honest conversations. Char was an incredible leader that way where, you know, he could bring out his best European, Mm -hmm. (laughs) Eastern European, (laughs) you know, wrestling dad (laughs) uh, voice and, and, you know, really lay it on the line and and say like, we need more from you and here's how and more from you and here's how. And guys had a black and white role and knew what was expected of them. Um, The guys on the fourth line, you know, were so proud to, be part of the best fourth line in the league and you know all that you know just that real pride in in knowing what your role was and knowing that if you didn't you know play that role and 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 up to the standards that was expected that you know you could be called out on it and you know nobody tiptoed around it um but you know in that series you know we had a few conversations um you know obviously it was a massive momentum swing when we went back to boston and got up a few goals and we you know we had the somewhat of a psychological edge I think just because of the you know goaltending you know when Luong was pulled and all the stuff that was happening and we were able to get away with a lot of pretty physical play without getting called and 
uh, you know, the biting and, you know, there's, it was a nasty series, but you know, our team thrived on emotion and thrived on chaos and, you know, thrived on being there for each other, you know, and, and, and so I think that that definitely played to our favor. Um, probably the more consequential talk though, was, um, when they went up on us and came back to Boston for game six, because I had been in that situation with Calgary where, you know, we had a chance to win the cup, uh, in game six. And I knew that, you know, for the most part, I don't think any of those Canucks players have ever had ever been there. And I knew from my experience that there's no way these guys are getting a good sleep. You know, they're up all night dreaming about their, their cup parade and what they're going to do with the cup. They just spent all day, you know, organizing all their families to come watch the game and get tickets and, you know, set up flights and organize all that crap. Um, and so I shared that with the guys, you know, that was my experience. And if there was one thing I could do differently, it would just be the stupid things like, getting a good, getting a good sleep, you know, like blocking out all the d distractions and just, um, you know, just really focusing on the game. So I, I, you know, we had a big talk about, about that kind of situation, about how we went through that with Calgary and about how there's no way we're going to lose that game. Cause that, that's what these guys are going through. And if we could really pound them, like we've got them mentally, like, oh, you know, X's nose kind of rah, rah, all this kind of stuff, but it was true. And I think that was, um, you know that played out. Obviously, I, I look like an oracle now. So <laughs> but, it's a great, it's a great perspective, though. Like, like uh, to, to that point, I mean, you were there. You know what those those players went through. And to Elliot's point, what a fascinating team to watch. Um, so many different, colorful personalities. Uh, whether it was Sedano Chara, who we've talked about so many different times here on the podcast and uh, and elsewhere, Patrice Bergeron, a young Brad Marchand, yourself, and Tim Thomas. Let's get there. I'll ask you the same question I asked Jack Edwards. Who is, or maybe I should say who was, Tim Thomas? Uh, almost a guy like Aginla to a certain extent. He could actually talk about a lot of things and obviously had, you know, very different viewpoints than, than myself. But um, he, he always did it in a very respectful way. And he was he was pretty sure of his convictions and stuff that he believed in and uh, what have you. And, and I really, I always re really respected him for that, you know? And, 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 um, I think it's really, it's interesting to meet people that aren't like you, you know, and, and mm -hmm. you can have, you know, that's, I think what makes the world interesting. And, and, and so, you know, we don't necessarily have to agree with, you know, the stuff that he believed in this and that, but we accepted him. And I think that was probably the important part. Right. And, and, uh, Damn, he was good at stopping the puck too. So he played out of his mind. I yeah. mean, that, you don't want to break it down. I mean, Chara and Bergeron, when they were on the ice together, nobody else touched the puck. And Tim Thomas was next level great. Yeah, I mean, he was next level great. And I think that um, it wasn't when we won. It was he had his idiosyncrasies and whatnot, but it wasn't a distraction. Like I said, we respected him, and, and I think he respected us, and everybody kind of did their thing and played really well. Um, it did become a bit of a distraction, you know, with the White House stuff and the next year. And it just, it kind of just elevated a bit to a point where it was a distraction to the team. Um, I'm, like, I'm, I guess I'm retired now, so I can, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I remember having, getting a couple, you know, called into the office. There was a leadership group uh, on the Bruins and we'd get called into, uh, Claude's office and, and he would just be sitting there shaking his head and, kind of flustered and uh he would ask us he's like i just i need your help he's like i call him in here and talk to him and he just calls me a communist he's <laughs> 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 like i don't know what to say i don't know what to do what do i do what do i do like and so he'd be all he's, flustered is claude actually a communist like, so, is claude this fair would be communist? <laughs> so he was calling claude a communist and <laughs> I don't know why, but it just, you know, he was an interesting guy. Like I We're said, just trying to talk about the penalty kill here, Tim, and you're calling the coach a guy. Uh, but I mean, he was like, like I said, it, it, he's a, it was a funny, it's one of those funny relationships because yeah, he was completely different and you can't say like we're friends, but we all respected, I think the fact that he's different and he's got his thing. And, um, I think there's just that line that you cross when how much, you know, it impacts your team with your, with your differences or different takes. Um, and when it starts seeping into, you know, being a distraction, then it's, it's tough. It, does anybody keep in touch with him? Yeah, I think Luch does. Um, I think Luch, Luch keeps in touch with everybody. Um, he's, he's probably the best at that. Um, uh, and, and I, th I think he's up in Idaho somewhere. 
I thought it was I heard it was Colorado. No, I think the ele- the altitude was like making him sick or something. Like oh, for real, like true oh, story. Okay, yeah. So I think he went. I think he's in Idaho. You know, you mentioned. Can we move on? Do you have any more? I didn't know if you had any more on Thomas. I wanted to ask you about Lucic. Like, um, look, like nobody's going to feel badly for a guy who's earning as much as he is. But I do feel badly because it's not working. And I think anybody who has any pride, and he has a lot of pride, it's it hurts. Do you talk to him at all about? how it's going in Edmonton because he I do think even though he's obviously keeps it private I do think he wanted to be traded last summer I do think they tried do you talk to him at all try to help him get through it yeah well he's got as much pride as anybody I mean he uh he absolutely loves being in the NHL he loves uh playing an important role on a team um and I you know I see I see the frustration, the same frustrations that I had too going to Edmonton about certain aspects of, of going there and especially coming from, um, you know, a really dialed, when, when you've seen a dialed in culture and, and team and how it's operating and you go to something different, it can be extremely frustrating. And, and I mean, you know, being from Edmonton and I grew up in Sherd Park, you know, I've seen it a million times. Like there's always a sacrificial lamb on the team that just gets roasted by the, the radio guys and the newspaper guys. And then the fans just continue that on, um, you know, and, and, you know, I think he's obviously taken that, you know, a bit and, you know, always got the target on your back with the big contract. Um, and, you know, he'd be the first to admit that, you know, he should be getting more points and score more goals. Like you get all that. Um, but, you know, it's tough, you know, it's, it's really tough to play there and, and to be, uh, you know, I guess the center of so much negativity and I don't care who you are, like negativity gets to you and, and, uh, it, it doesn't usually help you at all. So it's, it's tough for him. And, and I think that, uh, it's tough for any player transitioning from like a really super important role on a team to a secondary role, um, on the ice. I think he's still incredibly important, like in the room. And, and I think that's probably, um, you know, whenever I've talked to him, it's, you know, goals and assists and sometimes your play can dip and change and sometimes it's luck and sometimes you're just kind of not playing so good. Uh, but you can always do the stuff in the room and, 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 and to create that culture and, and lead uh, off the ace. You always have pretty much full control of that. You know, mm-hmm. that shouldn't dip and ebb and, and fall off the map. So I think uh, for a guy like that, you know, that's where you – have to maybe transition where your role on the ice isn't isn't so important, uh, but your role off the ice and in the room and, and as a leader, you know, you you have to magnify that yourself and, and really make yourself important in, in those ways as well. Is it a feeling almost like of getting caught or getting trapped or everything around you? I mean, this game changed, as you know, Andrew, fast. Like this game changed quickly. Do you think he has the feeling that maybe he got caught that, you know, he's, the same player like hey this worked not that long ago why isn't it working now that to me has to be one of the most frustrating feelings not just in sports but in life because you didn't change everything around you did well everything's changing yes but i mean i think that you know ask there's probably not too many defensemen that still like playing against him you know he's him on the four check when he's all rambunctious and running around i mean he's, he's not a fun player to play against it's just that when you've had really successful seasons like he has, I don't know what his top line numbers are in his best years, but you know, you're not hitting those same numbers that you used to hit. You know, you're not getting the same playing time. You're not scoring as many goals. Does that mean that you're horrible? No. Like I guess is, you know, you know, people, uh, people, you know, will automatically look at your contract and, and have expectations where you should be. And, and so they should, but you know, I think it's just some people might adjust their own personal, uh, um, personal expectations a little quicker than others, right? And just accept the fact that you know I'm not I'm not going to be that forty goal guy, you know, twenty two minute a night guy, you know. So what can I do? And and um, if you don't adjust that quick enough, yeah, I mean the frustration will be never ending. You mentioned it, uh, frustrations about going back to Edmonton. I remember a game on Hockey Night where you were the after hours guest with Scott Oak. And Edmonton got pummeled that night. Surprise. <laughs> well, no, but the thing is, like, we remember watching the game on air and saying, Scott's not going to get the guest. Like, there's no way Andrew Ference is going to be on the set after this. He's going to have to scramble and fill 30 minutes. And you showed up, which was great. And then, but you were really hard on them. Like, you lit up 
the group. And you've talked about that, and I don't think anybody watching that game would have had a problem with it. But what you just said a couple of seconds ago, I think there's a lot of Oilers fans out there wondering, why doesn't it work? You know, they have a, they've had a lot of great talent in there. Is there something there in the water of Edmonton <laughs> that contributes to all of this? Why do you think they've had so much trouble? I mean, I don't think it's one thing. I mean, I think I think there's a combination of 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 elements that go into it, right? I, I think that, like I said, that that aspect of feeling uh, like more scared to make a mistake and be the whipping boy rather than, you know, being bold and taking your chances and, and having that confidence to try, you know, to try the play or, you know, you, I think some guys, you know, might, uh, uh, get into that role of just being scared to scared to be the whipping boy. You know, I don't know if that makes sense, but like, I, you, I have you, heard you, that you take less before. risks and you, 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 your, your urge to win and be bold is, is less than your, your urge to not be the whipping boy or stand out, right? Mm-hmm. And so I, I, I think that is one aspect. I think that the, the the quickness that you know radio or newspaper or fans jump and and attack their own guys is is horrible. I think that the quickness to defend uh, players within the organization. I remember like you know Jeff Petrie or Schultz getting raked over the coals, and nobody coming to defend them, and then just trading them when they're. St- their values when they're after they've beaten them down for months then trading them it's like oh god and it's not just for those guys but it's for other guys on the team and you're looking at and saying like well they don't have his back like they're gonna have mine when it's my turn to be the whipping boy you know um Mm. but i think you know the most frustrating part for me as a player like like i said when i went in there straight from boston um was that you know like talk is cheap you know i went in and um, you know, Dallas Eakins is a, is a fantastic coach. There's another whipping boy who got dragged over the cold. He's a fantastic coach that was dealt just a pure crap hand in, in, a, in, a, in, in a team that would actually listen. I mean, you had a group of players that talked about how they wanted to make the playoffs and talked about, uh, how sick they were of losing. And then, you know, by game three, after losing six, one, they're straight out to the bar till three in the morning, you know? Mm lighten up the the night the night nightlife scene in Edmonton like come on give me a break you know like it's it was to the point where it was ridiculous where you know the 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 lifestyle was way more important than actually playing the game and making the playoffs but you know you like I said talk is cheap you know even in even in practice like you came from a group where you're playing you're practicing against like guys like Bergeron or Chara and you're going at each other like game intensity and that's how you get better that's how you be a playoff contender that's how you be a champion um and you try to instill some of those values and we had some other guys that had been on playoff teams and they had the same frustrations they'd come and practice hard and there's a group of guys there that you know had like uh like uh, it was like too cool to try hard you know mm-hmm. they like derogatory terms for trying too hard in practice like hmm. like that's the culture right and so how do you break that well you you come in and try to disrupt right and so i think that over the years there have been attempts to disrupt you know whether it was Eakins or you know I come in there or Pronger or like whoever it was like different people come in and 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 disrupt but you know I know personally it was really hard for me like like you come in as an older guy but far from being like one of the better players on the team so you can be a leader you know with experience but I'm not a game changer you know I'm like a number four or five defenseman so your voice only goes so far with people that you know, only respect, you know, how good your toe drag is and whether or not you're out partying, you know? So I, your voice doesn't carry much weight with people that don't put value on, you know, those, those aspects that I was bringing from Boston or that, you know, Dallas was trying to instill in the team. Um, so, you know, that it really like, was it not only frustrating, but it really pissed me off, you know, cause it's a waste of, you know, it's a waste of years in your NHL career where, it's just you never get those back Mm -hmm. and you see you know you see a coach like Dallas get you know really you know I think just so unfairly treated you know like I said uh it was he perfect no and he'd be the first to admit that you know he would rather do some of those things different but um you know he you know taking the blame for you know what are you supposed to do with a culture like that I always felt that and I agree with you on that about about Dallas I think he's a really good coach and I would you know, watch games and then, you know, read the reviews of them. 
And I mean, you played, you can tell me whether I'm off base or, or on base on this one. You know, I think it was after game seven or maybe game eight that one year you guys had the Western road swing to start down California and it was a tough one for you. And this is when you started that swarm defense and didn't work. And I think Dallas abandoned it after about game seven or eight, but then it would get into like game 12, 15, 20. And I would read about how, oh, this swarm defense has to stop and Edmonton. I'm like, is anyone actually watching the the game here? Like they, they abandoned this like games and games, like from, from your point of view as a player, on that team, you know, how frustrating is it to play, read the commentary afterwards and say, that's not even close to what we're doing? Well, because it becomes an easy narrative, like I said, like that uh, never happened on TV broadcast. <laughs> but like, I would that, just like to state that. Shot the print record. guys yeah. out, clearly. Yeah, purely yeah, print yeah. and radio. Yeah. When I, and I hate to rag on, you know, like you don't want to rag on me. Like, the, it, you know, like we were a bad team. Like we lost a lot of games, you know, we, we got scored on a ton. Um, you know, but there is a narrative where it's just easy to write about something and stick to it or whether it's a player or a concept or whatever it is, it's, you stick to it and you, it's fun to write negative things and rag on it. And I'm sure the people that call into the show will just, you know, (laughs) have lots to talk about and it makes it easy. You know, it's an easy, easy way to talk about a crappy situation. Um, Like I said, you could have had any kind of defense or any kind of system, but you know, if you go on a Western swing and your guys are out every single night till five in the morning, I mean, you're, you're not going to win too many games. 